Welcome in, everyone. Uh, it is Wednesday, December 22nd, filming a day early. We got the holidays coming up. Um, I'm your host, Mark Real. This is State of the Family Courts, and we have a, uh, we'll call him a reoccurring guest coming back on today. Um, we have Ted Bush from the state of Illinois. Ted, how are we doing today? I'm doing great, Mark, and thank you for inviting me on the Real Father's Rights Movement. Uh, I love your show. I watch it every week, and I, don't, I hope you're not count, taking your entire brand away, but the, I, I consider myself to be on the Real Father's Rights Movement show right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. And and I wanted to get you back on. Uh, we've kind of had a reoccurring theme here. I would say over the last six weeks, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of movement in terms of family court and what can happen and what's occurring right now in federal court. And I know you and I have had some conversations at length. You're someone who actually personally has had some success in carving some things out at the federal level. So we, we talked a little bit before the show. We, I had Ryan on last week, and the state of Minnesota is a little bit, little bit wonky, a little bit weird, where they actually put percentages, they actually put numbers statutorily on their books. So it kind of opens them up to some unique arguments, and, and Ryan and I discussed those. Um, so I guess we'll start out with yours. Yours is more of a, a general playbook that, in theory, isn't a class class action, but could be used in, in almost every single state. So the first thing I kind of want to do is, um, for the viewers, explain a little bit about kind of what your theory is on how individuals could be successful in federal court right now. Well, I think, I think that when, when we're addressing federal court, okay, just for right now, just forget money. OK, so if if people are out there saying I've been wronged and I'm I'm I want to get compensated for what has happened to me and you do deserve compensation, but you're not going to get it from federal court right now, almost certainly in your jurisdiction, more than likely the judges are considered state actors, meaning they're they're subject to immunity. Uh, so you're not going to you're not going to be able to get them. Uh, more than likely. Maybe in some cases they're considered county actors where you can sue the county. You might be able to get damages, but just put that all aside right now about your individual cases, because we're talking about the movement and we're making sure that the next generation doesn't go through what we've gone through. So we're trying to change the policies and the practices and the things that have happened to us that bring us together, the common abuses that continue to happen. Those are the things that that we're addressing here in, in this you know, rubric. And that's what Ryan is, is dealing with. But like you said, correct. You know, I love Ryan's ideas and they are absolutely applicable in that case because Minnesota opened themselves up to a mathematical formula. Uh, and his arguments are very, very well sound arguments. I, I enjoyed listening to them. But yes, in order to sort of get everyone together, to build together, there are a lot of things that can bring us together when we talk about federal court. Um, in order for that to happen, yeah, that we need to change the discussion a little bit to what exactly we would be challenging as a group. And so what what is that? In your opinion, what's at the core? Um, what I guess I guess we'll start out with what have you challenged and then what do you think the next steps are to continuing to chip away to have success in federal court? Right. to more narrowly construe the domestic relations exception? Okay. Right. Um, what's that core for our movement in the macro? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, what, I, what I'll do right now, okay, just so your your viewers are aware, is that you've got your state court system where you've got your circuit courts or your, you know, in New York, you have a Supreme Court, then you have an upper appellate court, then you have, and sometimes you have, you know, in, in some states, districts, circuit courts, everyone knows their state court system. Okay. In the yeah. federal court system, we have district courts all over the country, every major city divided into the states. And then we have 13, basically 13 circuit courts of appeals that cover multi-states. So at Illinois, we've got Illinois, Wisconsin, and Indiana. And in the Ninth Circuit, you've got California, Washington, Oregon, and Arizona, a bunch of, of lots of states, huge, huge circuit. Okay, yeah. so, so the law is different in each of these 13 circuits. So you're in Florida, someone's law could be different than someone's in California. And the, it's actually marketably different sometimes. OK, so the first thing in order to get into federal court is that you have to convince the federal court that they have jurisdiction. And there are a lot of things that keep us normally out of court. Now, 
what's happening it, it, and what I'll talk about my little victory that I had in the Seventh Circuit, where I got a federal judge now and, and the circuit to finally acknowledge that they have subject matter jurisdiction over these issues. Anything involving domestic relations. In Illinois, I fought the state attorney general because the state attorney general was to this day arguing to the federal judiciary that anything involving domestic relations was excluded from the jurisdiction of the federal courts. Anything involving, they literally did this, Mark, involving, okay, which which in, would involve, I mean, these people are mostly liberals, would include gay marriage. So they, their argument is like what, what Kwame Rule made in Illinois when I was fighting him in, in federal court. He was breaking his campaign promises because he campaigned on, on gay marriage and he was then taking the position of the Eagle Forum, which opposed the Obergefell case and, and re recognized rights for you know millions of people that if anyone was against, they would be thrown out of the street and tarred and feathered. Okay, that's that is so settled, you know, th those federal rights right there involving federal rights to, you know, to, 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 to let's say uh, same sex marriage. Um, but that is the extreme amount that these states are arguing, and that is not the law. And what happened in my case is that the Seventh Circuit reaffirmed, no, this is very narrow, is that we can hear these claims, constitutional claims, that there's unconstitutional behavior by anybody. We can hear them as long as the plaintiff is not seeking a divorce, a child custody order, uh, an alimony order, or a division of property. As long as you're not doing those core dissolution of marriage and custody issues if, if something happens along the way or or there's you know your constitutional rights have been violated by anybody they can hear it um so just so just quickly so back to the circuits okay so we got 13 circuits and what what the state of the law is on the circuits is that it's really not formed um that there, like for example in a few circuits like the fifth circuit which is texas um, there's an unpublished opinion from years ago where they sort of resolve the same issues. Yeah, we can hear these cases, the, the abstention doctrines, the Rooker-Feldman doctrines, the domestic relations exceptions, they don't apply. But a lot of them, because, because what happens is that these cases aren't brought by normal attorneys. They're brought often, they're just pro se, and there's usually a defect in them. So the, the law out there are mostly unpublished, unknown cases where they sort of get it, but not quite. There are a few circuits where that's published like the ninth circuit um and you, mark and i you and i we we talked about this case cook versus harding from 2016 yeah. in the ninth circuit where i think in your in your jurisdiction this is resolved as well in the seventh circuit it's resolved is that they can hear these cases um and the, I've, I've seen cases in the sixth circuit i've seen you know, a little bit here and there but very few have, have confronted this head on so it's extremely important that we've gotten, at least recently in, in the JV versus Woodard case, the, the ability, at least in these three states that I have, for the federal courts to admit they have subject matter jurisdiction. That is number one. So we can't do anything until we establish that. And let's let's kind of dive a little bit deeper, I guess, more on the, the surface level of that. We had, you mentioned Rooker Feldman, the domestic relations exception, essentially what we had had nationwide is that courts had been very liberal in the application of it. Anything, and essentially you had, and states are fighting for this, anything involving domestic relations courts, family courts, whatever they're referred to in your state, anything involving those, if it occurred in family court, oh, domestic relations exception. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's been litigated out already, mm -hmm. Rooker Feldman. And mm -hmm. what these cases are doing, it's not changing the law at the state level, but it's shaping federal law, which states have to follow, that are going to allow for bigger things to come in the future. This is not an issue at the federal level that right now we're going to be able to attack head on. We're going to have to get wins in multiple district courts or more, multiple circuit courts in order to more narrow this, these exceptions and to allow us to get cases into court when there have been constitutional violations. I think that that I think that that's largely accurate, but I think any circuit in this country, including that has no even unpublished opinions on this, that you could get you could survive a motion to dismiss if you have a, an honest judge, an honest federal judge. I don't think there's anything holding us back, but this is what happens all the time, Mark. And I, I used to work in Washington, where 
the law was clear, but the, 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 the bureaucracy wasn't following it. So you had to file a, a bill to do it anyway, even though the law is already clear. Like you've seen that before. And that's what's happening now. Yeah. They're just making us go through the motions. So we'll go through the motions. The, the bottom line is that these these this is such a conflict of interest, Mark, is that the state attorney, there is nobody looking for justice on, on these federal issues. Nobody in the state attorney general's office. In Illinois, they just defend the defendants, the state defendants. They just reflexively go into them as if they're the defense attorney. And they're not looking at, wait, what what's going on here? Like, can we step in and can we, you know, re resolve something like this? Uh, they they, yeah. they are a partisan against you when, in fact, they could come in independently and and file their own motions and make their own cases and say, no, yeah, we do have a problem. We do need to make some changes here. There's that in, at least in Illinois and most that, that's your enemy is the state. You met you mentioned it. The attorney general came in and in a state that is consistently blue, literally came in and took a position that the Supreme, I mean, 2015, I was in law school when Oberfell, um, the ruling came down. So that was, that was an entire year of con law. Like they're going in in this well settled, pretty much agreed upon by, I would say, what, 95% of the country, at least at this point, that we're, that's what the law is. We're cool with that. Uh, they're coming in and making an argument that directly contradicts it just to defend this small point. Oh, what their their analysis, their, it would take us back 50 years. Okay, Stanley versus Illinois obviously came out of Illinois in 1972. It was one of the, it was one of the most famous cases that every single one of your viewers should read. It is an easy case to read. You pull up, you pull up this case and 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 you read it and you read how egregious it was that in 1972, 50 years ago in the state of Illinois, if you were an unmarried father and the mother became incapacitated, you lose custody of your children without a hearing. They go up to adoption without even a hearing. And that went up to the Supreme Court. That involved domestic relations. What do you want to know what also include domestic relations? Loving versus Virginia, interracial marriage, Palmer versus Sedoti, racial discrimination in, 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 uh, in custody decrees. Okay. All these cases going back that have, that have established fundamental rights, these state attorneys general are trying to destroy because they are so committed to protecting their own financial interests, meaning being sued. Yeah. And, and when you bring it up like that, I mean, those are some of the most well-known Supreme Court cases. I mean, um, the Loving case has has its own feature film um, right. about it. And and it just it, it kind of flies in the face. So I think that goes back to uh, I think one of the big movements. I think I, I want to give a shout out to Casey Sowers, the executive director. I think he's done a phenomenal job of trying to change the narrative of the narrative. The opposition of this wants to paint is it's the angry dad. It's the deadbeat dad. It's this is not someone that we need to pay attention to. This is just someone that's acting irrationally. This is someone that's acting emotionally. They're not fit. They're just trying to get out of child support. And when you start to look at it, those cases are extremely comparable. They were individuals that at the state level were, were being stripped of rights, were being stripped of due process. And many people opposed it at the time. And now we look at it and it's just common sense. Yeah. So I, 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 it's, I've, I've never, I've never heard that verbalized and it just makes a whole lot of sense is this is, this is one of those things that I think that the, the biggest piece outside of obviously working in each state to change the laws, um, work in each state, whether it be through lawsuits and federal court to change, uh, the way the state operates in these courts. But I think maybe the biggest win could be if, the movement was able to fully reposition itself to put it in the light of that. Um, I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with an attorney, Ashley Nicole Russell out of North Carolina, and we talked about, is this an issue? Um, we know criminal courts. Um, any attorney that we've done CLEs, we've done law school classes where we talk about in criminal court, there's a huge issue with race. The darker your skin, the longer your prison sentence. Well, we don't have the data in family court because the states seal all of it. 
I could almost guarantee you the same exact things happen in family court. Um, and, and there's some some kind of anecdotal studies that show that like black fathers are three times as likely to lose all access to their children as their white counterparts. But we don't get that raw data or, or, or this movement or this this issue would be completely reframed um, within society of today. So I, I guess what, what's what's kind of your thoughts on that? Um, I, it's hard for me to answer that. I mean, I can maybe mark what I can do is I can go into an example of an unconstitutional policy and practice and how I think that that would be a real, if we got this implemented, let's say we moved and we, let's say we got the relief that we wanted from the, from the federal court after several years, what it might look like, what family court might be different if we were able to go in in federal court in cir- certain circumstances. Yeah, let's, I, I don't let's, know. What, what's the, what, what's, yeah, I think that's a good, good turn point there. What, what's the, what's the output of these lawsuits? What's the output of carving out the ability for us to know how exactly to get yeah. into federal court right, so, with domestic so, issues? So this is, this is generally my view and, and, and people have to understand and because and, and, I've seen all these cases and so many of these cases that are filed are, are filed by people that are not attorneys. Okay. So I've seen the people make horrendous mistakes. They sue the judge, they sue their, uh, their ex, they sue the, uh, the, uh, the other attorney, they sue the guardian ad litem. They're suing everybody and they're basically going in and complaining that I, I got screwed in state court and trying to get a, an appeal. That, that, that is going to get you thrown out. That is not going to be, you know, that, that is not a serious suit. But what, what, what I think that they are, that what I personally think that the judi- state judges are vulnerable to right now are suits in equity for mandatory injunctions uh, by, by a federal court for violating a constitutional right. Now, a constitutional right is something as basic. Well, first of all, there's two elements to the constitutional rights that we have Okay, in, in, in these state proceedings is number one, we have procedural due process rights for notice to be heard for, you know, for there to be a hearing, for there be, to be findings and, in a, you know, a fair adjudication under the law. Those are all rights that you have procedurally and that are, and they could be those are federal rights that we have as individuals, individual federal rights, not given to us by the states, given to us by you know God and, and our constitutional founders. The other element is substantive due process, which has been sort of built up since the 50s and then really solidified in 2000 with Troxel versus Granville. It says that fit parents have a, a fundamental right to you know raise their children without interference by the state. OK. Well, what's happened is that the state has interfered completely. The state, the, what we have, and that's what the, the suit that I brought in the Seventh Circuit, is that th- these are about civil cases between two people. The state is not a party. Big Brother is not in there to tell you what is in the best interest of their children. They're there to resolve a dispute between two people and, and, and determine what's in the best interest of the children in the context of the dispute. Not for the state to come in and say, I think it's in the best interest of the children that they not see this or that they not see this. They're coming in on their own and making their own conclusions without a motion pending. OK, so what they're doing in that case is they're making sua sponte orders. They're acting as enforcers like they're the attorney general or they're the police. They're charging you. They're hearing it. They're not even listening to you and, the, and deciding your rights on their own, on their own initiative. And, and there are egregious examples of that happening. That happened in Illinois, for example, with a woman who lost her, who we know, her, uh, who lost custody of her children, a woman, because she didn't have a COVID antibody uh, shot. And the judge did it on his own. Well, I'm, you're not going to be with your your son uh, because until until you, this was his own on his own initiative, and it was illegal. And he ended up you know, getting international attention, national attention. He recused himself and he reversed his order. But anyway, that's an example of a judge exceeding their jurisdiction, okay, coming in and entering orders on their own. I believe that the federal courts would have the ability to enjoin those kind of orders because, because that is the, the judges don't have immunity to suits and equity. That's not a c- complaint for damages. And you're being immediate, you're, you're subject to. A te- preliminary injunction, temporary restraining order, immediate harm, uh, no adequate remedy of law. There's all these things because the judge is coming in and being, you know, playing multiple roles. And if you look at judicial immunity cases, uh, judges are immune for damages from suits, but not from equity. 
for 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 things that they do in in their duties in their adjudicatory duties that or excuse me in their in duties other than adjudicatory sorry so yeah, so yeah and i think i think looking at it you look at go ahead go ahead, go ahead, no, go ahead Mark. no no i'm done I was going to say, I think that, that in, in saying that, I think that I, I've seen numbers anywhere between 70 and 90 percent of litigants in family courts are pro se, pro per. They're representing themselves. And I think that lends itself to, to creep. So the judges, when you have someone who's going to be in front of you five to seven times or whatever it may be, and they're representing themselves and you do that over and over again and you're overworked, it lends itself to that judicial creep where they've taken more and more and more leeway in what they do. When you think about other types of law, if it's going to be attorneys, it's going to be a five-year-long employment case, an employment right. discrimination case, or, or even something at the state level, um, state criminal courts where you know the person's going to have an attorney, it lends itself, the attorney is going to stop right there and say, you can't do that. But in family court, I mean, I, I walk into family court, let's just say the week after Christmas. I mean, there's a very distinct possibility that it's going to be me or and one or two other attorneys, and there's 15 cases on the docket. And so how is that lay person able to say, no, you can't do this? Number right. one, they're terrified for their life. It's the most important thing in their life, and they don't right. really know what they're doing. So there's not as many attorneys to step in and say, Your Honor, you actually can't do that. Um, and it's just become part of kind of the lexicon in family court is that creep and the, the, the ability well, just to really do anything and everything. Mark, Mark, it, what you touched on is so important. It's honestly one of the most important things that, that happened here is that, yes, you're touching on an overloaded docket, which we know is a problem. We're the ones trying to reduce their damn docket. But but what what you're yeah. what you're stating there is that the, that the attorneys are afraid to put the brakes on this. OK, that's why, honestly, I tell I when people come to me like, you know, I really need to get an attorney. You know, there's Joe Emmerich. There's a, you know, a few others in Illinois that. That are that are good folks. I, I know a handful, maybe a few, but but you, you, the pro, the problem in Illinois, and I've seen this, and I've had multiple cases of this happening, where judges enter orders that are catastrophic without without hearing, without having any idea what's going on, without due process, and the attorneys do not put the brakes. The attorneys, if, if the attorney should if, in Illinois should not even allow the judge to touch the order that he could sign. Okay, you have a duty. As we all swore to the to the Constitution when we got sworn into the Illinois bar that we would never, ever, ever allow people's procedural rights to be violated that badly. And nobody stands up to it. And why? Because they all make that's how they make their money. That's all this motion practice is how these people make their money. And so they all look the other way and, 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 and violate their oaths of office and do things. And, and Mar just Mark, that's. Most of the cases that I took were like that, okay, when in Illinois, the cases I took for clients and extremely contentious under that circumstance. And what I'm dealing with, and, and I'm having these attorneys freak out because I'm just filing a procedural due process objection, okay? I, like that happened in Cash Jackson's case where I came in and said, well, Cash, mm -hmm. you, he moved to Arkansas. You can't suspend his time for move, moving to Arkansas. So I came in in Cash's case, and we knew that all the facts and that Cash hadn't done anything wrong. So I just filed a procedural due process complaint. So like, let's just throw this out on procedure and start over because he didn't have a hearing. Oh, everyone went crazy. The, the ju Judge Janelle Christensen went, yeah. you know, she, everyone lo lost their mind because here we have this rot and we are covering it up. And, and all you have to do is just start over and they won't even do that. That is crazy. Yeah. That and is I think uh, that's – there's no other – I mean, I, I guess I, I – I, labor and employment law was what I studied in law school. That's the firms I clerked at. And in federal court, things like that would just absolutely never fly. The judges always – and this is that's the benefit of going to federal court. Ryan kind of mentioned it last week. You have state court judges, and, and a lot of them practiced for – a short period of time and, and now they're on the bench, they may not be fully comfortable or fully qualified where typically if you get in front of a federal judge, that's kind of the, they're a professional. 
Um, they're a pro. They know what's going on and they know what to do. Usually they have pretty substantial experience. So that's another benefit of, of getting into federal court. But yeah, I've experienced that with the opposing counsel. I've, I've seen where we've had issues where we agreed upon, like the parties agreed. And I'm like, okay, let's just write this up and submit it to the court to sign. Let's not give them any discretion. Oh, no, you need to file your request. We'll, we'll file our response and the judge can decide. I'm like, the parties agreed. Oh, well, this is just how we do it. And it's to run up billable hours because all of a sudden it takes two or three court hearings, court appearances, and $3,000 from each party for us to get something in writing that the two agreed upon and then came to their attorneys to write up. Uh, so I, I think I think you're dead on in that. And I mean, I think you see, I'll, I'll call it our profession in general, um, terrified of any change, terrified of anything. I know in California right now we have, um, there's a lot, there's some, some, some things coming down the pipeline about non-attorney law firm ownership. And you would think that they were going to abolish the court systems and the legal profession was no longer going to exist. Um, so I think it's a, it's an issue where they don't, change something that's always perceived as bad um anything with the legal profession but i think it's especially ingrained in in family court i mean i, I don't mean to take too so much of a what, what i want go i'm just curious for you Mark. Yeah, go ahead. i mean when when just my question for you just out of my curiosity in your experience in california because i feel this way in illinois when you walk into court and you do you spend an afternoon litigating issues that you can't even believe are even being heard by a judge about, you know, silly little visitation issues or who talks to the kids on the phone at what time, like, and here we are litigating this in a courtroom. Did you feel that way? Uh, yeah, I kind of feel like there's two segments of attorneys. And I think there's a segment of them that is practical and let's resolve the issue. Um, because yeah. I, I litigate really in two completely different demographics. Mm -hmm. uh, in Riverside and San Bernardino County, it rarely ever goes to trial because the parties can't afford that. And right. Orange County, everything from the get-go by every single Orange County attorney is this is going to final trial. So yeah. I find myself in Riverside and San Bernardino County, especially I would say attorneys under the age of 40, where you call them up and say, this is dumb. Um, if I can get my client to meet you halfway, can you get your client there? Because we don't need right. to litigate. We don't need to yeah. litigate who gets the, the PS5 in a divorce. Right. Like, exactly. can, can she give him like, can she give him the couch and then um, she can take the PS5? Like, I can get my right. client there. Can you bring your client? But Orange County, yeah, 100%. You sit there and just some of the things that get brought up to judges about really anything and everything where it comes to property, whether it comes, like you said, the phone calls, drop off and pick up locations, like these little details that you spend entire days in the courthouse litigating over that in reality, two reasonable attorneys should be able to sit down and say, this is dumb. Um, like let's play, let's play rock, paper, scissors. Like let's do something. Let's not spend an entire afternoon in orange County litigating that if it's going to be a 20 minute phone call or a 30 minute phone call, like it's Illinois, just, it's just silly. In Illinois, it feels like the default. And, and honestly, if we, if the citizens of Cook County and, and surrounding counties thought what was going on, there would be a taxpayer's revolt that are, Oh my, are you kidding me? You've got sheriff's deputies and all these, you know, court staff and the judge and all the administrative people in court to hear this. There was a child dropped off on a particular day, and is it, it let's say the father going to get the counseling and the doctor's information he's entitled to? You're spending court time on that. Yeah. Sorry. Or <laughs> there was a time two months. Ago, hey, hey, I see. The other day I had one. There was two consecutive weeks, three months ago, that dad was more than five minutes late, but less than ten minutes late to pick up. Yeah. And, and we were in court for it. And, and the judges, the judge is clearly frustrated by it. And I think, like I said, there's hey, you got court, you got court reporter, you got the court assistant, you got the judge at minimum um, in that right. courtroom that the taxpayer and the bailiff. So you got four humans that the taxpayers are funding that are not are, are paid very well to, to deal with silly things like that. And I think you touch on a really good point. 
And while doing shows like this, and, and I know the Father's Rights Movement, there's so many others. Chris Cole, I know you and I are going to be on with him together mm-hmm. in the new year. Mm-hmm. Do a fantastic job of educating the community. I think that's one of the things that will change public perception is one, one, one of the kind of promises I've made to myself in the new year is that I'm going to get on media that's maybe maybe it's father centric or man centric or or political or whatever it means, but have the conversations about what's going what's really going on in these family courts outside of our circle um, because yeah. we we sometimes end up talking in a vacuum and I mean let's just be honest like if we went to our peers who are working at Kirkland and Ellis or Jones Day or wherever they're at and we told them what happens in family court they would they'd be like no you're lying you just made yeah. all of that up yeah it's, it's like, lost I mean, it- Law students would go into shock if you took a law if you took a law student from the classroom to a domestic relations court. I, I suspect they might consider dropping out of law school. Just last week, I was in court, and the the firm sent a, a, it was a new associate who had never done any contested hearings or anything else, and she's like shaking outside, and she's like, "Well, what what's going to happen?" I was like, "I don't know. There are no rules." Like. We're we're gonna we're gonna make our arguments, and there's really no basis or or, or justice in any of it in this hearing, most likely. And she just like looks at me in shock. She's never never practiced in front of a judge like that. I'm like, we're gonna make our best argument. They're gonna make a ruling from the hip, and then we have to deal with whatever they they rule. Well, and and, and in my, my own experience, and I've seen this many 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 times, but this is what we have to deal with as fathers, and you know, I've, and and uh, mothers too as well, but the fathers. I've noticed this. You probably noticed this in California. I, I was doing a motion earlier this week, and 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 I it looked like I was going to win the motion. Like you know, the facts look look pretty good. But when what happens is these attorneys come in and then they just start lying, just like they know where things are going, and they'll just start making these just like it's like they do it on purpose. Like they have three or four. Like all right, this is my plan. If I if this isn't going well, I'll just start lying about it. And then at the at the end of the proceeding, without any evidence. Without any witnesses, they're just throwing stuff. Oh, he got into an occultication with this person and this person. And, you know, they get away with this. It's unbelievable. I, I've i had a couple cases where the man was the victim of domestic violence. And we have awful domestic violence laws here in California, yeah. um, where it's basically a long-term presumption you shouldn't have any legal or physical custody. And I had a photograph of my client having been stabbed three times with a steak knife, both shoulders in the back. We had three different instances where the police report said there was no doubt that mom was the aggressor. And I'm like, the law says you have to grant full legal and physical custody to my client. And the judge, she sits up there on the bench and you can tell it's like, she's a little bit uncomfortable because usually it's the other way around and they have no issue flipping the switch. And she ends up not even making an order that day. And I'm like, and I looked at her and I was like, it's clear. Like she's been arrested three times for this. She's been, she's pled guilty in criminal court. I have pictures of stab wounds. You have to rule this way. No, I'm going to wait for a report from the mediator. What's the oh, mediator yeah. going to say? Right. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the, te- that's the, that's the awful part of it is it's, they're applied inconsistently um, as well. We just have to get these cases out of court like that. Your guest from North Carolina, Mark. I mean, it, it is the safest place not to be in these courtrooms. It is dangerous. Yeah. And I mean, here, here's the thing. I think that, I mean, we're talking specifically about men. Obviously, this happens to women, too. I know you you have several clients who who had dealt with just nasty things and vindictive exes, and, and the woman was on the receiving end. 13% of women go through this as well. So yeah. it's majority men, but 13% of the people who experience this stuff are women. So it's not, not necessarily exclusive, yeah. but, uh, but I mean, yeah, I think in most States, like I went back and when I, when Ashley was coming on, California has almost identical laws to North Carolina. Um, and a lot of States do have that collaborative process. And I found that for men, at least the quicker this process start to finish, the better the outcome it usually is. Usually if it drags out, um, like you mentioned, the attorneys just start lying and it's like you had a conversation in the hallway with her uncle and then all of a sudden it turned into you accosted her uncle. And then the next time you got into an altercation with 
with her uncle, and, and this is a this is pattern of behavior. So I think I think in terms of sanity for people who are going to go through divorce or child custody, that collaborative process could save both of you a lot of headache and a lot of money. What happens in Illinois is that these judges and attorneys teach the women usually how not to even communicate. That they break down the communication. Oh, you have to use talking parents. You have to so first of all they limit the the, the things that you can say and, and that you can speak to. But, but in, in what I've witnessed here is that they give these women every incentive not to cooperate on anything or to even talk. And so they create a, you know, or, or they have create a, a, a system where, oh, you, it's lovely to talk between the attorneys because that, that's, that's lots and lots and lots of money. The attorneys can talk amongst them, but yeah. that communication gets brought down, gets bogged down. Then you go into court. And the court, it's not a normal communication in a court. It's not normal human interaction. It's all structured and regimented with rules of evidence and all this, you know, your honor, please, the court, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, uh, and, and it's just it broke down, broken system fundamentally where it is just fundamentally un dysfunctional, except for the attorneys stringing this out for years and years and years. Well, I think I, I, you, like you mentioned, you get into a game of telephone. It's that's exactly what happens. You get into this game of telephone where attorneys talk to their client, then they go back to the other attorney, and the attorney goes to their client, and then the client comes back to them. And by the time you get back to the middle, what I mean, there's no, there's no actual communication. Like we had, I had a client who. Um, opposing counsel and and his ex in court were being extremely combative and he ends up back channeling through his like ex mother-in-law or something and he comes back to me and he okay yeah um we agree on all of this we want to go to mediation on custody and whatever they recommend we're going to do and i called the other attorney and said hey here's what i just heard and the other attorney's like no no that's not true like we have issues with x y and z and like I just got a phone call from my client sitting in the same room as your client. And that is exactly what I was told. Yeah. But attorneys don't want to believe that because, I mean, that's a, a $4,000 case where if we make 15 court appearances, it's a $60,000 case. God help us, Mark. So I know we've, we've gotten, we, we've, yeah, it's, we, <laughs> we've got, we've gotten into a lot um, in terms of what happens, I guess, behind the curtain. Um, yeah. I want to kind of bring it back because prior to the show, you talked about you had a you have a little bit of a working theory on how you think that um, going into federal court, you don't that you don't necessarily think class action is going to be challenging because of what it takes to certify a class. But you believe that there was a method or a way where multiple individuals could go in together yeah. Yeah. When constitutional issues arise, you want to kind of talk us through what yeah, your working and, theory is on that. And so I'll give you just a brief history because I've researched all of these on, on the history of basic class action lawsuits involving uh, unconstitutional policies and practices. OK, the first one that I'm aware of is a case that everyone should be aware of if you want to research and you want to be a student on this issue is a case from the Sixth Circuit in 1980 called Parker versus Turner. And and that was a case where a, a group, I believe, I could, I, I might be getting mixing these cases wrong, but I think it was a group of Tennessee fathers that challenged the Tennessee child support system, uh, the child support scheme. Basically, they all got together and they filed this, and they got up, and the the Sixth Circuit abstained in that case. But there is there are a lot of things, and, and it's not really even relevant law now, but. That is an example where that got up and the, the Sixth Circuit didn't, you know, it, their case got dismissed. But it was like, if, if, if the state courts are proving unwilling to do something about this, then we'll hear it. The problem that happened in that case is that the plaintiffs didn't actually go through the state appellate court process at all uh, or challenge, the, you know, any, anything that had happened. You know, they just basically went right into federal court. Um, there, I saw another case in Florida. Uh, a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, where there was another class action involving, you know, family law related issues. So they were able to get in. The most recent one that I think is the one that another case that your 
viewers should be aware of is a case called Allen versus DiBello from the Third Circuit, which was from 2017. It was brought by an attorney in New Jersey by the name of Paul Clark. Uh, and, and Paul's still in contact with people in the Northeast part of the country. But what, what Paul did is Paul got about 10 people together you know, all fathers that had gone through horrendous things, similar things, not having hearings on motions, not having the rights just completely violated, just everything, all these problems. They got together and he combined them into a complaint. And it was it was fine. Uh, he, he he was challenging a, you know, a, a statute and he was challenging all these unwritten customs and practices. And there wasn't an issue. They, they litigated jurisdictional issues, sort of what I did in the Seventh Circuit. And there were a few, they made a mistake that mm -hmm. caused them to get dismissed, but they got to the, th they brought their claims to the third circuit. It, they, it was sufficient pleading in the complaint. So, so you don't, I don't think you necessarily need a class action. You just need 10 people that have had relatively common experiences. It doesn't have to be the same experiences, but relatively common where you can legitimately state that that I'm bringing this on behalf of myself and as well as people similarly situated. That's and I mean, hey, here, here's the cool thing about that as we further kind of develop theories like that. Um, 20 years ago, you didn't have Facebook groups with 50, 60,000 people. You didn't have resources. The Father's Rights Movement probably in January is going to eclipse 700,000 followers. There, You can find individuals. Um, that have have experienced similar things um so that i think that's the cool part and i think that's part of what's moving kind of our movement forward is the ease of access to people with similar stories right and so what what i think so, would have to happen good. sorry so in each district you would have you to find go. people and you could have multiple counties so let's say in, in northern district of illinois we've got you know maybe six or seven counties we've got cook in this in surrounding counties uh, you could potentially in one suit bring in multiple counties. So what you have is one person in, let's say, Lake County suing the chief judge of the Lake County in their official capacity. You've got the chief judge of Cook County in their official capacity. You've got you know DuPage County. And, and not all of them are going to have the same problems, but there's common elements. And so I think you have the ability to bring in the actions of you know the systemic unconstitutional practices of multiple counties into one single suit in a, in a particular district. But I don't I don't see how we could have a multi-district class action. I don't think that that's possible at all. And I think the movement needs to walk away from that. Yeah. And I mean, you, you, and you think about it, it's it's one of those things where I can think about even outside of obviously I talk to, to dads all over California on a daily basis. But you would be surprised. And I'm sure you get some of this, too, Ted, the number of I mean. I, I feel like four times a week, someone from Houston, Texas reaches out to me with a similar story or someone from Chicago or Miami or whatever it may be. And, and so I think that, I mean, I, I think all of this is a snowball. Once this happens once or twice, it's going to be something that when these type of suits get filed, hey, you cite this law and it may not hold precedent. It may not, they may not be required to follow it. But if you have three districts and a circuit or two that are following this, it's going to be very compelling. And, and hopefully it's going to reduce the friction um, in, in getting through court and getting a, a, a ruling that's in favor of, of what look, we want. And, and what happens, Mark, and, and you know this full well uh, from, from your experience in California, I can tell you what it is in Illinois. Is that the fathers groups? I mean, we've got you know Casey and, and Fathers Rights Movement doing amazing organizational work. Other people doing amazing organizational work. But who who's the counterparty between the judiciary and us? Okay, we're 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 just a big big swarm of people, and and so by bringing suit, I mean I think that the way you communicate it to the pub to the press and the public when you bring the suit is. We just want to talk. We want to talk. There, there's no listening sessions. I used to work for a U.S. senator. There's, he did listening centers in every county in Wisconsin. Okay, there's no listening sessions in Cook County amongst the judiciary and the fathers and the, and the public, the people that are actually undergoing this. Though they're more than happy to talk to the lobbyists with the Illinois State Bar Association, but who's actually talking to us? 
And so by bringing these suits, I think that that is a tool where, you know, you can, they're, they're compelled, they have to attend court, they're going to have to file a motion to dismiss and try to throw you out, you're going to cause them a headache. But in, in the meantime, it might give you an, a, an opportunity to be very diplomatic and say, why aren't you people talking to us about this? We're, tell, we're talking mm -hmm. to you about things that are fundamental to a system of justice that you aren't following, and we're tired of it. We're tired of walking into court without a motion pending and walking out not seeing our kids based on nonsense and lies. That's not asking for a lot. Yeah. That's that's very very true, and I think that that uh, the the diplomatic way of going about it is it would number one if it works it makes things happen a lot quicker, and it's a lot cheaper, and in theory if it's if it's a diplomatic solution you're not going to spend years defending it. Um, it's once you come to that resolution it's going to be resolved. Where I think we see I mean we see it now in the mainstream media Roe v Wade. Um, settled law for for 50 years and now now it's under attack um, in terms of what it's going to mean moving forward so i think right. that diplomatic piece for anybody whether you're dealing with a state legislator it is a listening session whether you're able to have conversations with someone of influence coming at it with the the proverbial olive branch and being diplomatic about it is probably going to get you further then the fire and brimstone, we're going to vote you out. You're screwed. You're going to be getting hate or, emails for the next or decade. We're gonna, or we're going to sue you, right? That's the other yeah. thing. Or we're going to sue you. But but the bottom line is that we are not going to get anywhere in changing this if we cannot credibly sue them. We have to be able to credibly sue them. And we can't sue them in their own system. It has it has to be in the federal. You know, the federal courts are don't 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 anyone out there think that these federal courts oh but, you know well we've got jurisdiction so we'll take these cases they're doing everything that they can to keep these cases from being heard in federal court because they don't want it either they know well, how yeah. much of a can of worms uh, and and what this this smoking pile of of despair and and abuse that has happened to so much of this population is boiling over okay i mean it, it, this is this is you know the anger of fathers is boiling over. And these people have to know that. And if they're smart, like any politician, they take proactive measures, sit down and talk this out. But if they don't do that, then absolutely we have to sue them. Yeah, well, 100 percent. And like you said, I think I think in a in a big picture capacity, the lawsuit could bring them to the table. And right. bring them to conversations because I, candidly, I've had conversations with some politicians here in California, and I I whip out a book that I have some just different materials, different things in, and they're in shock. They had no idea any of this occurred. Um, I know I've I've been on calls with some legislators all over this country over the last six weeks, um, leading into next year, and they want to know what's it like in courts. And a lot of times they're in, they're absolutely shocked. A lot of time in the states that have been successful in Arkansas, their bill was sponsored by an attorney who stood up to his peers and said, this ain't what's happening in court. Right. Here's what's really going down. Um, in many of the states, it's I, I, one state in particular, not super public yet. So I won't I won't drop names. But the two or three individuals that are involved in getting this bill out there this year are all fathers who have been through the system. So they understand that what's written and what on its face is fair and equitable is not what happens when you step into that family courthouse. Yeah. Well, so the, the, I think educating those people is big. Yeah. And, 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 and part of this is, is, is that we have to brush these people off because what is happening is that the state is coming in and declaring war on fathers. War. I mean, it, it, when, when you're going into court, dragged in, and your rights are violated, and you're and you're just back and forth, and, and child support, and, and 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 contempt motions, and alleged incarceration, and driver's license suspension, and all this stuff, when you're just you're you're going broke, just trying to be a father, that is the state declaring war on you, and and that is what is happening, and that the state has to be brushed up. We have a statute, 42 U.S.C. 1983, the Civil Rights Act. Because in the Supreme Court in prior cases, which I can cite, have stated 
that, that the Civil Rights Act, the federal 42 USC 1983, is to protect when the state itself becomes an instrument in the abuse of power. And that's what's happening is that's what we have federal laws for. The state, the federal courts, nor the states want to confront this. But but it, it has to happen because this is going to boil over. You, like when you say the cases, they don't even have the ability to hear these cases. You get more and more of these cases building up and building up and so much injustice and so much absolute just pillaging of, of, of innocent parents and, and children by these attorneys and in and, and, and this process ruinous it is a war and, and and the state declaring war just a guy showing up to court hey i just want to be a dad no we're yeah. going to destroy you instead that is what's happening yeah 100 percent. and i know it's it's out there um i'm actually uh we're hoping for a february february or march release date um in the process of, of the the working title right now of the book I'm working on a few people with is the war on dad. Yeah. And that's, that's truly what we're seeing right now mm -hmm. it is it's a, it's a war. It's primarily a war on dads. Like I said, I don't want to any, any women who are watching this that have gone through these types of things. We, Ted and I will both stand on, on the milk crate and say, this happens to men and women. It's indiscriminate. It just so happens to happen to dads at about an 80 to 90% clip compared to the 10 20 it happens to women but uh no that's that's that that's for me I'll, that's the perfect perfect I'll, I'll statement you, is this I'll truly is a war on dads and, and i don't talk i try i don't always talk about you know my own case but i'll tell you my own personal experience in the last few months is that i'm fighting to see my children with stage four pancreatic cancer diagnosis and and i'm sorry that's you know we talk about i was talking to a guy yesterday on the phone He's like, you know, you got to talk about this is sexism. This is sexism. And, and I said, no, I'm not going to use that term sexism because because sexism in, in, and I think in our usage and vocabulary is, let's say, walking past a girl and, and tapping her butt, you know, or saying, oh, you know, you know, demeaning, oh, hey, girl, hey, little girl or something like that. That's sexism or not paying someone a full wage where, where, where a man's being, you know, that is it. But when you're ripping out the fundamental existence of their fundamental rights as a parent and a person and demeaning them and attacking them and just constantly, 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 that's not sexism. That's bigotry. And, and, I, and I, I feel strongly about this, is that, is that when you're talking about the war on fathers, there, there maybe needs to be a new term uh, you know, about what this kind of in, insidious discrimination and bias is. That there is bigotry amongst these people that think, wait, wait a second, this guy's got cancer. He may have months to live and we're twiddling our fingers, whether, whether he should be spending time with his kids, that is bigotry. And we are confronted with that and we have to be honest about it. Yeah. That's so uh, we don't even care if you're alive or dead. I mean, that is how low the, the war on fathers has gotten. Yeah, that is. Um, I, I I don't think it could put, be put any better. Um, that that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're fighting against. Um, it's been an uphill battle, uh, but I, I think that that we're we're getting close to to. We've obviously had some breakthroughs. I think we're getting close to even more. Um, but I think I think your your monologue there is is a great place for for us to kind of wrap up today. Um, Ted, I want to thank you for coming on again. Um, it's always a pleasure. Um, and I know you, you you mentioned your medical stuff. I know you got some big stuff coming up. So you're, you're definitely in my thoughts and prayers. And I, I know you you have the support of this community behind you because we, we absolutely do need you. So um, I, I hope that everything uh, you got going on through the first of the year is uh, goes as planned and, and we uh, we get to see you out the other side of this. Um, and everything that, you do, Mark, everything that you and Casey and Ken Rosa and everyone that you got amazing work. You have my attention every single day. Thank you. Thank you. That's much appreciated. Um, and for our viewers, this is going to be the last show of the year. Um, we may have a replay going on the 30th, but uh, I will be back live on January 6th, I believe is the date. Um, with the, uh, start of 2022, we got some, some heavy hitters, not as big as Ted, but we got some heavy hitters coming up in the month of January. 
So um, to all the viewers, thank you guys for watching. We're about seven months in. We got some exciting things in 2022. Ted, um, hope to have you back soon. You always provide great insight. And uh, we'll see everybody soon. Thank you.